Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Amas y caballeros, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon for our panel presentation on principles for effective support to the media sector. I'm Nick Benequista, and I'm the senior director of the Center for International Media Assistance, which is a think tank, uh, a small research unit attached to the National Endowment for Democracy, a congressionally funded NGO uh, that invests uh, fairly significantly in the media sector as a donor uh, around the world uh, in defense of journalist freedom and uh, media development. And uh, I'm joined by a really excellent panel today. I'll introduce them uh, momentarily. But uh, first, I'd like to start with an old joke uh, that some of you may have heard. Uh, there's a wise old fish swimming in the ocean, and she passes a couple of young fish. And as she passes, she says, how's the water today, boys? They swim by silently. And a moment later, one of the young fish turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> and the joke, it, it brings to attention the fact that we take a lot for granted, including in the field of press freedom and media development. Much of the work that we do here for press freedom, for media development, occurs with the support of international aid, bilateral aid, multilateral aid, philanthropic aid. And this session and the project that it's related to it is about how that aid gets organized and the impact of that on our work, on our ability to move the needle on press freedom and media development. So this, this question of how aid gets organized is often covered in, dis in discussions around effectiveness. Uh, there have been many official declarations over the years uh, that have established principles for effective aid. Rome, 2003, Paris, 2005, Accra, 2008, Busan, 2011. And all of these documents point to the importance that international aid be demand-driven, in other words, bottom-up, that it be coordinated, that it have country ownership. Uh, the effectiveness agenda has a, a slightly less formal cousin, as I see it, in the doing development differently movement or in participatory development. Uh, and you may have heard about these kinds of concepts and principles discussed in that, in that context. Now, if you're just a journalist, you may not have heard of any of this, of course. Um, However, over the past few years, there's been a growing appetite to establish principles for effective support specifically within the media sector. And what's interesting is that it's come from the donors themselves, donors like Sweden and the Swiss. Many of these large donors have made efforts to be better partners in our sector. And it's actually coming from a place of very good faith they would like to be sure that the best practices in terms of how we structure aid to this sector are mainstreamed and are practiced more consistently. So we have an opportunity over the next year. This is where it gets a little bit bureaucratic sounding, but there's an opportunity in the next year or so to work with the OECD DAC the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the Development uh, Assistance Committee. This is the club of big donors around the world. We have an opportunity to work with them to have an official policy instrument. It might be called a recommendation, it might be called guidelines, to have something of that passed at a ministerial level uh, that would enshrine principles for effective support to media development. And as I said, this sounds a little bureaucratic, but the principles themselves are often very simple and really important, and they have applications even beyond a policy instrument within the OECD DAC. They can inform our discussions collectively with private philanthropies, and they can inform the important discussions we have to have with how, as a sector, we engage with the big platforms and with big tech. So SEMA, the Center for International Media Assistance, and the Global Forum for Media Development have been partnering to try and put together a draft of these principles. We've been doing that by pulling together all the research that there is in the field of media development, evaluations and academic research, uh, research that exists on effectiveness in governance support, uh, and we've been doing consultations so far with about 80 individuals 
uh, including a consultation that was held yesterday morning. And we have some participants here who, today who are a part of that. Uh, these consultations have been a, a fire hose of wisdom. There's a lot coming in. And so we hope to give you a taste of the richness of these discussions and I think the importance of considering the water that we're all swimming in. Um, as I said, we've got a couple of wise old fish here to deliver uh, some of that wisdom. Um, maybe some not as old as others. But um, so let me start, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them and then we'll jump into the questions. Uh, so first we have Christina Zahar, a journalist uh, that's to my very left, 30 years of experience, uh, including at the Folia uh, do Sao Paulo newspaper and the Abril publishing house. Uh, four years ago, Christina took leadership of Abraji, which is a membership-based support group for investigative journalists uh, in Latin America. She oversees their monitoring of attacks against journalists in partnership with Voces del Sur, uh, and she is also engaged in monitoring gender-based attacks, uh, with, in part with the support of UNESCO's Global Media Defense Fund. Uh, to her right is uh, Guy Berger, who will be known very well to you all here, I suppose. Uh, if, if many of you do not know, Guy began his career as a young uh, journalist and activist opposing opposition, uh, was uh, put in prison for his principled stand uh, on against apartheid. Uh, he had a long academic career that followed, uh, including as the head of the journalism department at Rhodes. Uh, I'm astonished to see that you've written more than 50 books and book chapters. Uh, I'm not sure I've read more than 50 books and book chapters. No, I'm just kidding. And, uh, and he's been at UNESCO since 2011, where he's the director for policies and strategies at the International Program for uh, Development of Communication. Uh, and to his right is uh, Mihal Yab Strebner, uh, who got started in journalism uh, at the young age of 22. Uh, after years of working in journalism, she moved into strategic communication, working for digital startups in the region. She later pioneered teaching on entrepreneurial journalism uh, in Argentina, and eventually, in 2015, really bringing all of these interests together, uh, founded uh, an organization called Sembra Media, many of you be familiar to many of you here, uh, with Janine Warner. Uh, and uh, as now as executive director of Sembra Media, uh, Mihal has you know, built this regional team based in Argentina that supports a network of more than 100 consultants uh, in 20 countries, uh, really the heartbeat of the effort to make journalism more sustainable in the region. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Midge. Um, you know, working as you do on sustainability, but of course, you know, in the environment of the aid industry that often supports much of this work, can you tell us a little bit about what aspects of that industry are frustrating to you and what you think needs to change to do this work better? So I'm going to speak in Spanish, and I will take advantage of the opportunity being here in Uruguay. Hola a todos. Voy a aprovechar. I'm going to take the opportunity to speak Spanish and to share this knowledge with you. In Spanish, one of the main drawbacks or changes of mindset that we need to face as a uh, media ecosystem uh, for those of us who work uh, providing support uh, as well as those who provide uh, funding or training or those that have specific roles is to understand how the media companies operate and what is the purpose of having uh, core f or operational funding. And this um, brings us back to a question, a question to the future. And that is, uh, core funding enables the development and creation of spaces to build growth and to be able to talk about sustainability as we said before, sustainability is not money in the bank. Clearly, it's a strategy to plan several years ahead with resources. And when we mean resources, we don't only mean money, but we mean human resources, talent, capacity building, product building, and understanding of technology. So clearly, one of the challenges is that 
those of you that are on the side of the donors and how to use this ecosystem could consider how those core funds are provided and how they are delivered. So if we um, try to make them more effective, we have to say that it's not only about money. It's about helping and accompanying the use of this money in a strategic way. And then we have the tradition of supporting some areas by projects or by program. And if we want to build significant changes, not only we need to support, but we also need to build knowledge of what works and what doesn't work. One of the main challenges of the funding on development of the media is the capacity to build flexibility and provide agile support. And one of the things that we learned in Sembra Media was uh, speed to have accelerators to generate agile learning systems during the funding process. And this is important not only because it enables us to be more flexible in terms of the original plan, knowing that our social, economics, and, and um, financial uh, situations will change, but also to generate capacity so that the media can learn how to pivot the changes. If the funds have this approach, not just of generating core, core funding in the programs, but also to sustain them with planning and learning capacity, then we do have the capacity of um, uh, planting ideas that are more consolidated. And that would be transformational to the market. This comes up frequently in the consultations. You know, we really do absolutely need to move from short-term, narrow, project-focused support to more long-term, reliable support. You know, take an example like Malaysia Kini. 15 years of international, you know, that is now a shining example of a, of a highly sustainable digital news outlet. It relied on international support for 15 years before it was able to um, become the sustainable outlet it is now. And of course, you know, the long-term funding for organizations like yours to help folks to look to the questions of the future. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this links well to, to your work, Christina, because we were having a great conversation earlier this week, too, and, and these themes were really strong there in, in your work. Um, you know, your, you've, you came to uh, Abraji with a, a great deal of uh, passion and vision, and we know that sometimes in the realities of the aid industry, you've got to compromise uh, that vision or compromise your ambitions uh, to keep your organization afloat. But it seems that you have found uh, a, a good donor uh, and, a, and a good accommodation with that donor to be able to uh, work long term and to create an organization that is um, serving a fundamental role. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to steal your thunder. Go ahead and let us know how you've done that. Thank you. Well, when I started at Abraji after uh, coming from the private uh, media industry, um, I came with all my background of um, um, shifting career uh, from being a journalist to being a manager. So um, Abraji is turning 20 years uh, this year. So uh, it wa it's a, an organization um, created by journalists and for journalists. And uh, what I found when I, I began there, they, they had a set of funders, uh, but no core funding. And uh, one of the achievements um, I, I could do with my team, it was a core funding by Illuminate. And uh, it was very interesting because um, they came to us. They, they came, they looked after us. And um, they asked us, um, they offered the core funding and they asked us to build a kind of a project to use those funds. And uh, I drew the plan with the, the board of the directors of Abraji, 
and um, we used uh, the funds to hire two staff because when I got to Abraje, I had no financial manager, so this was <laughs> a need. And um, we also hired a, a digital communication manager to manage all social media um, of Abraje. And um, uh, on top of that, we developed um, a plan also to um, do a branding campaign uh, that finally I couldn't do during the, the pandemic, but we, just, we, we used the funds to uh, campaign to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Abraja this year. So this, this is the kind of funds that uh, we need as a uh, civil society uh, organization uh, because it's not tied to a project. And uh, I think the message to the donors is, okay, you can fund a project, but if you don't fund the organization as a whole, it will be a one-time project and then the organization will fail. So I, I think it's important to, uh, to go after this core funding, but this is based on relationship. We are going to renew it this year, but um, yes, you, you must have some commitments also because all the funders, they have their goals, they have their agenda, but uh, this must be a match and a win-win. Let me just ask one follow-up question for, for you two. Being Southern-based organizations, do you think that makes it harder to find the kind of core funding that you need to grow? Go ahead. We are based in California, U.S., so it's very different our situation. In our case, uh, we are uh, Sembra, uh, it's located in a very strategic location, and the idea is to bring that to the specific area and to the areas that uh, need attention and economic support. So we do find that there are areas, Uruguay, for example, is one of the countries that is, has, very, has a lot of problems to bring problems, Chile the same and that affects the culture of the organizations to apply to funds. After many years of not being prioritized for the donor, on the donor agenda and on the international philanthropy, they lose the culture of how to build networks and how to bring the attention to some uh, problems in democracy that are uh, the values that the media are defending. And this brings back the problem of funding for countries, for smaller countries or countries that don't have a recent history of funding. I was going to speak Spanish. <laughs> I was going to speak Spanish. Um, yes, I, I agree and, and I think Again, it's, it's based on relationship, but it's tough because you, you as I started in Obraje uh, four years ago, they uh, I already have a lot of funders. For instance, uh, we are funded by Open Society um, many years ago, and um, we have a, a project that is called the, the Tim Lopez Project that we investigate and we follow killings of journalists in Brazil. We are following now uh, four uh, killings, uh, but last year, they, when before they changed all the, their priorities, they gave us this uh, core funding uh, as well. But this was different because we can use it without uh, a plan. So um, it, it's it's difficult, and uh, I find sometimes, uh, for instance, we are trying. Um, funds from uh, European Union and uh, this form to fill and all the things we had to have to do we worked hard and and we don't know if we're getting it and sometimes we discussed this uh, yesterday the, they ask a lot of information and sometimes it's it's, it's tough to have it all 
because you have different kinds of organizations in different uh, levels of development. Yeah, I mean, look, many donors are, without a doubt, trying to deliver aid more directly to civil society organizations in the South. I think many donors also understand that the reporting requirements are so onerous that in, to impose them on uh, an organization directly in the Global South is also unfair, and there are good justifications for working through people who know the paperwork. But uh, Guy, uh, you know, some of the, the interesting thing about this principles work is that it's a mix of um, ideas that are pretty ambitious and will take time to implement and some principles that are actually pretty simple if we can just find a way to implement them more consistently. And I think, so there are some, there's some low hanging fruit potentially. And you know, I, the IPDC um, has often done a lot with very little. You, you guys are masters of um, strengthening the field, often with, with a small amount of resources. Um, what have you learned about the sort of small things that we can do to improve the aid industry in our field? Thanks, Nick, and thanks to CIMA and also Global Forum for Media Development for championing this issue. So let me start by just saying I think the top principle that we need <laughs> is for donors to put themselves in the, in the shoes of the implementers. <laughs> um, and I say that partially because this is my experience. Before I joined UNESCO, I, st I was in the market to get funding. And I started a conference at my university on new media and African journalism. And over 20 years, we built this, this, e this event to bring 500 journalists to a small town in South Africa. And I did it in the beginning by going to companies, not donors, companies and saying, will you sponsor? Now, when you're dealing with the corporate sector, it's transactional. I say, yeah, we're sponsored, but we want this branding, we want to speak at this uh, cocktail party and so on. So you learn this game quite quickly about you're selling a service to these companies. They're not there for, as philanthropists. And that, was a very interesting and successful experience, I think. But I also began to realize that the similar thing can apply when you're dealing with donors. Because donors, there's a, there's a development industry. Donors have to reach certain targets. They have to shift certain money. They have to show some things. So you can sell them a service. You can say to donors, this is what I can deliver for you. But it's transactional. And there's a good side to that, but there's a bad side to that also. Um, because transactional can be completely mercenary and, you know, kind of, you know, there's no uh, solidarity or real partnership. But, of course, in the development industry, everybody says partners, partners, partners. It's a lovely, uh, romantic uh, experience. But when you're in the, in, out there on the, on the, at the coal face, you are hustling for money, you know, and you're going to sell and you're going to kind of pitch and you're going to make these deals. Um, and the, the donors need to understand this. They need to put themselves in your shoes that you're desperate to do what you think is, is fantastic activities, but you're desperate to get the money. And, of course, you're not going to do anything to get that money, but donors need to be a bit more sensitive to this transactional thing. They should not think that they are somehow the good guys, uh, you know, presenting you with support and solidarity and, and charity. It's, it's a relationship where they have to deliver, have some deliverables, they have to tick off some metrics, and so do you. And you get into it, I think, with clear-cut thing. Now, having learned that on the side of hustling for funds, <laughs> when I got to UNESCO, I joined the other side. <laughs> because it's a us and them, and now I'm part of them, or maybe I'm us, I don't know. But I changed sides. Because at UNESCO, this committee, Nick, uh, IPDC, it is a donor. Small scale, $20,000 grants for about 50 projects a year. But this is where it, it uh, I think, is interesting. And this is another principle, maybe, that uh, could be kept in mind. How, <clears throat> what do you do with a small fund like that? Of course, $20,000 for you know, a community radio station in Sierra Leone is not small change. But in the big development picture, I mean, it's not much. You're not going to change the world with that. However, um, what I learned as, as now being in the donor space is that Principles are important because otherwise you're kind of flying a bit blind as a donor. You don't really know how you're going to operate and you know, you're making ad hoc judgments. 
And first of all, I think you've got to realize as a donor that if you fund 50 projects a year, five are going to fail. Ten will run into political obstacles or implementation obstacles or COVID or whatever. Others will be mediocre. And anyway, you come to a small quotient, which I suppose is the normal what you expect uh, from in business, you know, 20, 30, what's it, the Pareto principle, whatever it's called. Anyway, to wrap up on this point about you still, as a donor, you, you don't know in advance exactly what is going to like hit jackpot. And this IPDC, about 10 years ago, and I actually see my colleague who coming into the room uh, from IPDC, it supported, with $20,000, a project to train judges on freedom of expression in Mexico. And we didn't know like, if this is going to do anything. And this thing became so successful that now, today, UNESCO has trained 20,000 judges, prosecutors, uh, security forces, around the world, in Africa, uh, Latin America, has memorandums with the police association, prosecutors. It all started from that small thing, and other donors then came in. So, you know, you can start small, and you hope it'll scale. Not always, because you can't tell, but you need to try and keep that in mind. That's the second principle. And my last principle, I think, uh, Nick, is that... Um, in fact, you and I have discussed this Sometimes, you know, people need money, they need to pay their bills, they need to hire people, they need to do research, got to pay the electricity, rent, internet connections, publications, uh, campaigns for communications and so on. And that's what they really need. But sometimes they're so busy with their kind of, you know, working, they don't network enough and they don't pay time for ideas. And as a donor, you can actually, although it's not going to bring them immediate returns, you can encourage like a brudge, you know, I mean, this is an association that has, you know, a lot of impact, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the individuals. And so this is, I think, what's important. As a donor, can you convene? And can you convene not only at the level of money and projects, can you convene at the level of norms? And this, uh, one example is that in this IPDC committee, which is run by governments and their representatives, one of them said uh, 10 years ago, you know, why don't we really push that the UN should have a system-wide plan of action on safety of journalists? And one thing led to the other, and now it's 10 years with this UN plan of action, which is not only the UN, it's all the stakeholders. And donors are pumping money into this because it's such a crisis. But it started at a normative level, and it was that normative innovation to have a coordinated harmonized framework on safety of journalists. That's the kind of thing I think uh, one can do. So as a donor, you've got to think at the normative level, at the scale level, and also put yourselves in the shoes of those who like, are really working hard to, <laughs> to kind of deliver what they want to deliver. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Those are all terrific suggestions, and they resonate strongly with what we've been, what we've been hearing from these consultations. There's, we've touched upon a few things already that, um, one being the way that aid gets, moving aid from short term, ad hoc, uh, narrowly results focused to longer term, uh, to one that supports institutional growth, that's strategic. Um, but also, you know, you've touched upon, Guy, in your comments, um, the, the importance of investing in our ability to set norms and to think about what has to happen in the enabling environment for our work as well. Uh, those are two themes that have come up. And there's, just a, there's a third theme that's coming up on the principles as well. A little harder, but to deal, a little harder to figure out where to go on this, but it's with regard to all of the challenges we've seen in the digital realm and how that affects our work. Um, and Christina, I wanted to turn to you on this because you know, you support these great investigative journalist uh, outlets, uh, but of course, disinformation, online harassment, surveillance, uh, and the commercial failings uh, associated with uh, digital media. It, faced with all of that, uh, I'm sure it can seem, seem a little overwhelming. What is the role of the aid industry in your mind uh, relative to these, plat these big questions of platform governance and regulation? Well, the question is, um, for instance, um, 
and Google and now Meta, Facebook, Meta, they are they are funders of Abraji and they fund a project that we run that is called Project Comprova, which is a coalition of 40 media outlets that work on fact checking in Brazil and they work in collaboration. And it's very interesting and in how they do it because um, they verify um, false information, gossip and misinformation, disinformation about pandemic, uh, vaccines and uh, elections and um, uh, public policies. And, and usually two or three or four media are involved in checking and publishing as a network. So uh, what I think it's important is to think of the big techs as partners um, in some agendas that are common to our goals and our pillars. And, but there is also another role that Abraji plays and other um, associations and organizations that fight for freedom of ex expression, access to information and transparency. And then we put another uh, hat and we talk to them about the problems, the issues. And uh, we, for instance, we have a, a run last year with uh, the support of a global um, media defense fund from UNESCO, uh, monitoring on gender attacks. And uh, most of the attacks they are uh, originated or they are um, uh, publicized by uh, the internet, by digital media, social media channels, and uh, mostly against w women. So this is the kind of things that you, you must balance when you are a, an association like us. So we can use funders to do common ground projects, but we also have our role of uh, um, talking to them about issues that uh, algorithms created with all this. So this is what we do. And this uh, does not prevent us from doing the monitoring on, on digital attacks against women. And, uh, you know, just um, we want them, of course, to to, to change, and we know this is very difficult because they have their business model and uh, viral content go first. So we know that it's difficult, but uh, this is a balance that uh, we are trying to achieve. It's, <laughs> it's very tricky, but uh, yeah, we are managing. Let me follow up on that because of course it's true. The, the platforms are donors. Uh, and at the same time, they're in a sense policy makers of the digital realm that we live in um, and the object of our advocacy and lobbying sometimes. Uh, so just to be clear, being a recipient of, uh, in, in this partnership way of, of meta um, funding, has that given you greater access, you think, to, to the decision makers at meta who are shaping the algorithms and policies that affect journalists in the region? No, I don't think so. <laughs> because in Brazil, as we are in the South, they say, no, this is global policy. We cannot touch, we cannot uh, change or give you an answer or whatever. Ah, oh, we will see. I, I remember they, uh, Twitter came, we, we went there, we did a meeting, I think three years ago before the pandemic, and uh, we asked them a fast track so we could uh, address when journalists uh, were being attacked, so we could go to them and say, okay, uh, can you help this journalist because he's being harassed? And uh, they gave us the fast track and that's it. So, so they, they, they say they cannot change. Maybe initiatives like we are doing here with you, with JFMD, SEMA, can give a voice to, the, to, to us, Global South, that we can uh, address those issues. Midge, I have another question for you, but you want to jump in on this? You're nodding a lot, and I wonder if there's something brewing in there. <laughs> you know me too well. Um, no, I believe 
I believe that just as we said that we need to have conversations about the future, not to have conversations of the past, I believe that it is very interesting to hear Chris because it allows us to think of things outside our dichotomy. And the truth is that in a recent survey funded by Illuminate and SEMA and Inflection Point International, where we studied uh, digital native media from Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa, we saw that grants are the most important funds that the media get, and donors, the greatest donors, are these companies, Google and Meta. They play a very influential role, not only economically, but also through many programs with many of our organizations. We believe that changes policies or gives us a chance to change policies. No, I agree. No, it doesn't. Not right now, but there are many conversations that we would not be able to hold or funds that we would not be getting if we were not even um, talking to them. We have to, to bear in mind that there are many diverse needs the claim made by traditional media or public media versus um, native digital media. And regulations have different implications for them for different types of media. And that could also lead, or it, it was already happening, it leads to uh, struggles amongst media, different media, and we have to be careful not to contribute to a conflict that different media groups struggle in repeating the, the old struggles for publicity now about policies. And another comment is that we should add Twitter to our conversation because right now it is in a very crucial time and I don't hear people talking about it in regulation and it has uh, a great influence besides monetization of content. Ask that we also have a more equal, that that partnership, that romantic partnership that we like to, uh, that we idealize, that it be a more equal partnership, that we want to seat at the table also in these big conversations about, um, you know, how the digital commons are governed. Look, the same is true with bilateral donors, frankly. You know, there's money flowing to uh, train journalists to defend themselves against cyber attacks coming from countries where they're not taking enough action to block the sale of commercial spyware. You know, so uh, I think we, there's a, there's a, this is a, this is a tough, this is one of the big principles, not one of the easy ones. Um, but I think making sure that that aid partnership uh, extends to uh, enabling our concerns and our voices to be heard at the global level in the policy debates that are really shaping the future of journalism. Um, Guy, you know, you've, you've worked at multiple levels as well and, and the UN plan for uh, the UN Plan for Action on the Safety of Journalists, it does have many of these hallmarks of effectiveness. It, you know, at the very highest levels, garnering political will, norm setting, uh, considerable funding, academic research, broad consultation with civil society. A lot of that has been packed into the the UN Plan for Action on the Safety of Journalists. And you know, do you think there are some lessons to be learned? Is that an example to be looked to? Uh, have some mistakes been made there? Uh, anything to be learned in general from that, for these principles? So on this particular case, uh, I think the principle is not to be too, too much metric driven. Because people say, well, you had this plan, 10 years, journalists are still being killed, women journalists are still being harassed. But it's very hard to, of course, that's true. But it's hard to look at the counterfactual, which is to say, if there had not been some of this action, could the situation have been even worse, which is quite feasible. Because in some cases, uh, just to take the example of Carmen Aristide, no, it wasn't her, it was um, uh, the journalist yesterday from um, Colombia, uh, Claude, Claudia Duque. She said she got this car, uh, protected uh, car, which is part of this, you know, the mechanisms to protect journalists, which have been inspired by this UN plan of action and so on. And um, <clears throat> so she got this car, but then she discovered it was also full of surveillance of her. 
okay, that's a, a, a problem because also she wasn't even told about this. However, she had a car, so a bulletproof car, and so she wasn't assassinated, which is quite feasible. I hate to say, but you know, people like that can be assassinated, maybe because she had. So it's very hard to prove with this thing. And so, if you're a donor, you've got to be a little bit careful about being too positivistic, too empiricist about you know, you've got to meet these metrics because you know, there's a lot that's that's unclear. I think that's that's number one. Number two, um, these things they long hauls. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the case of uh, Malaysia Kini, but you know, securing safety of journalists. En este caso se fue un caso de seguridad claro, es donde a incluir, inclusive a UNESCO a veces los países eh, participan de alguna manera en, en el asesinato indirecto ¿no? de, de periodistas, a veces porque no informan, a veces porque informan mal, esto depende del sistema, a veces depende del periodista, etcétera. Entonces, por eso eh, ese es el principio que quería mencionar. El otro principio es el rol de, el, de los actores de asistencia de los medios. Um, y quisiéramos decir... Respect your constituency of people who are looking to you for support. At the same time, because you are sitting at the center of a big web and they are like isolated, you have a role to play to bring them into contact with each other and seed ideas that they might not have had. And I'll give you just two quick examples. We had a session here at UNESCO, uh, organized by this IPDC, about what data would be useful for media companies if they could get it from the internet companies. And a lot of the media companies, they just, they, they're under such pressure, they don't even think about this. And so they say, yes, we need transparency. Yes, we need money. But you know, if you start going into it, you, how do you establish the value of how much the, the tech company should give you? You need some data, you need access to data. More than that, you also need to think, if you get 100 terabytes of data, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and so then you start thinking, okay, um, if you're a media, maybe we need to form some consortium or maybe we need to demand to the tech companies, not only do they give us data, but they give us uh, a secondment of data scientists to help us analyze, or something like that. You know, it's just that I think as a media assistance thing, you can play a role in catalyzing this. Yeah. And I'd say, for example, on the same thing about data, and a sister initiative to this data for media viability is data for safety of journalists online. Because at the moment, everybody's trying to clean up the mess at the end of the process. And yet, if you had data, you could begin to see an early warning thing. You could see what attacks are beginning to scale against which journalists, on what themes, how they're orchestrated. You could demand that the tech companies start doing protective measures. You could actually also you know, develop counter messaging, the whole lot of stuff. So from a safety point of view, um, it's important to get data on what's happening with online safety. Yeah. And so that's my point also that when you're in the media assistance business and you're dealing with the, a lot of people don't think about that because they're so, you know, journalists in newsrooms, they're getting this abuse. But what do they do about it? So, you know, they maybe complain here, as you said, and they get no response. But if we could organize systematic data yeah. uh, and, and process it, you know, then that's yeah. quite powerful. Because today the name of the game is data. Yeah. Mid, you want yeah. to jump in? Um, one of the last eh, principales. Eh, one of the main uh, guys' uh, statements here is not to be very metric driven, and that also involves not to be very standardized, to be more flexible. And, and one of the things that I think still matters is that there is still not consensus in terms of sustainability. We don't have consensus either in terms of what are the key metrics that we consider when we think of feasibility and when we think of the health of the security of journalists, their capacity to protect themselves from legal attacks. Many uh, media companies don't have funds to defend 
themselves before the possibility of a lawsuit. And this is dramatic for the democracy, really. So an exercise that we, I think we need to do to support the media company and the donors is to uh, stop measuring uh, shiny facts and numbers and to measure the impact, to teach the media to measure impact and to accompany those impact metrics. In Sembra Mia, we help the media companies systematize impact and we realize that about 80 percent of them have a way of documenting their impact but they have concepts that are not discussed or institutionalized and what data we can generate so they don't know what stories they will tell about their development or their role as an organization in the society. And this is a problem when you need to find uh, funding. And similarly, because this topic has not been systematized or discussed among the donors and the organizations that support the media, this translates into the fact that when we speak of media, we think of quantitative uh, measures and metrics. And in not all the uh, media need to be massive or to reach all. Remember that the media are there to serve a certain community, and the communities could be small. So it is important to start to speak of the impact we want to have so that we can change our man, our mindset and move away from the traditional metric systems that we have always this thought of. For democracy in terms of, um, you know, the different roles of different media organizations. And it's just not, I totally agree, it's just not fair yeah. to apply the same metrics. There are instances in Russia, for, you know, for example, where if a media outlet is able to do the independent reporting that's otherwise absent in the country, you know, with with so many sites blocked, uh, with so much censorship, impossible that they're going to be reaching a mass audience. Mm -hmm. But they're keeping the light on uh, for independent journalism, and that is enough. Um, and so there there is often, I think, a tendency to kind of standardize the metrics in a way that can be really destructive. And donors themselves sometimes are not very clear on why they support certain outlets in certain uh, contexts versus others. So, you know, it's a little bit back to the theory of change, too, being a little bit clear about what, what's motivating you, what we think we're going to get from this. But I, I, and, and just, and I, I totally agree that this should be a participatory discussion, too. It's not about the donors deciding what the impact is. It's about uh, everyone who's involved learning about what they're achieving and having the ability to adapt uh, to serve that role, whatever it is, better. Um, did you want to jump in on this? Before, I thought we can also, we have a few minutes. We can actually open the floor for questions if we have the technological capacity. Laura, in one moment. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, Guy, you gave me a wonderful idea because <laughs> about knowing, for instance, who starts uh, attacks online. Uh, in Brazil, we have... Uh, 75% of uh, uh, stigmatizing uh, speeches against journalists. And uh, most of them start on social media, and most of them, 62% uh, by public officials. So uh, who are they? How, how many attacks, uh, for instance, President Bolsonaro, his sons, uh, his ministers, his followers started? and how many robots and trolls they mobilize to attack journalists. This would be a wonderful and priceless information for us. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the, the latest World Trends report on uh, freedom of expression and uh, media development also calls for a stronger data-driven approach. Uh, but again, it's a little tricky because some of the private philanthropies are so caffeinated about data, and that data isn't just about learning. It is about accountability. It's about the log frames. Um, and so I think we just, we want the data, we just need to be sure that the donors also see it as a 
asset and not as a tool for uh, control. I see some hands up. Can we, is it, is it all right if we hand a microphone out for a question? <laughs> uh, no, no. Hi, everyone. Introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm Laura. I'm the general director of Chequeado. That is the first fat checking in Argentina and the Global South. Uh, thank you for panel. It's really interesting. Going to the title of the session that you are trying to develop principles and effective for media assistance. One of the learnings that I've got the last years is it's useful for the media leaders or managers to discuss with the grantors much more than what we are used to. Um, in my experience, that works. Or, or at least in some cases can work. And I, I just comment to, to Sebastian that in Chequeado, for example, when we have a project that is not a core grant, it's a project specific for a, I don't know, a, a workshop, a series of investigative reporters, etc. We discuss with the donor uh, about the salary of the person that going to be in charge of measure the impact and write the reports. Because as Michal said, the reports are useful not just for us, but for all the network that we share. Then that's just my five sec cents. Discuss more, argue more, <laughs> uh, don't be shy, and perhaps you ha can have better results. That's great. Michal, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think organizations like GFMD and it's not like cute, but Sembra Media as well have these conversations with the media and we try to like get these conversations further. Um, I, we were talking earlier, uh, uy, estoy hablando inglés, I'm sorry. Estamos hablando más temprano. Earlier we were talking about We were talking with the different media and interests in terms of their sizes, in their locations, and the type of public that they the type of public that they address. So when we have these conversations, such as the one that Laura was mentioning, uh, unless we acknowledge that all media companies have different challenges and objectives and opportunities, it may happen that the conversation cannot move forward. So it is a recommendation from our experience. We focus on digital uh, native media. Uh, it is our idea that these conversations move forward and recognize that the media have different challenges and that it's important to listen to one another. So this does not lead to discussions in which we might have power struggles or more serious discussions that could be um, uh, could be, be damaging for the journalist ecosystem as a whole. Any other question? Uh, do we have any other question? We have a few minutes. Question to you, possibly you and Guy. At what stage in all of these principles do we consider the level of media literacy and knowledge donors need to know about the media? I sit with donors in Freetown, and sometimes we are put together in consortia with mainstream development organizations, building schools and uh, providing water and sanitation. The understanding of the media is to provide information. Oh, the BBC can just do us this jingle. And that's not what media development is. And that's not what media viability is. What is the principle of educating the donors about understanding the job of media? Thank you. I have a quick response. But you... <laughs> so I was, I was doing some research in Tunisia, met with a, a donor from, I think, then Diffid, um, Great guy, works on financial transparency, was suddenly thrust into a project supporting reform of the public sector broadcaster in Tunisia. 
no experience working on this kind of stuff ever. And, you know, he was a terrific guy, was looking for ways to figure out how to carry out this project, and he had no one to turn to in country. And when you think about other sectors of development, you, you show up in any country that receives a lot of aid in health or in education. If you're a new donor onto that subject, you will find a working group uh, that probably has some kind of a, a, a strategy that has been endorsed by the government with civil society uh, input. And there's going to be a ton of experts in country who will quickly teach you, <laughs> you know, what, how you can be helpful in that area. We don't have that in the media sector. And it's going to be hard in such a small media support, such a small sector. It's not like we're going to have the media development coordination working group in every country in the world. But it might be something that we can build into the kind of governance uh, working groups at the country level. And, and, and in those spaces, invite media outlets and, and civil society organizations that represent the media of interest to get them at the table in those spaces because they can be some of the most important spaces uh, for forming a kind of a collective agenda. So that would be my, that's my view. I mean, we can, they can do some training, but it really needs to be coming from how, the, it's not what they know, it's how they get the knowledge that's important in my view. I think that's, that's a good point, which I hadn't thought of. But um, I would say in this example you gave, um, there's a market there. They want to spend some money on something. They're looking at you as a possible client who can supply a service. Buy it. I mean, if, they, if that's their understanding and it's not against what you're doing, so sure, you want jingles, it'll cost you this much. At the same time, we want to combine it with ABC, and so that'll cost you extra, and that will achieve more sustainable development purposes and so on. So uh, I'm a bit more <laughs> hardened, I suppose, because you're dealing, and even those who know about media development, they'll have different interests, they have different budgets, they may have different traditions. We know, for example, um, to crudify it, but you know, USAID, USAID it likes private sector media. We know the Nordics are happy to support more community media. We know the, the UK likes to support public service broadcasting. So when you're in the field, you've got to kind of play this market uh, as it is. And I think that, um, of course, you try and educate your, 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 I mean, they're also clients of yours in a sense because you have this, this transaction. So you're trying to educate them, but you know, if you just think that uh, you have to wait till they get educated, I think you'll wait a long time. But the, the coordination is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you know, participatory coordination is the important thing. Too. Uh, Christina, do you want to jump in on any of the themes that we've covered in the last few minutes? We've, uh, I feel like we maybe have neglected you on that side of the table. But no, no obligation either. No, no, no. Well, I think, uh, well, the final, if I can give some advice based on my experience, is go for it. Sometimes you, must, you can dance with the devil without selling your soul. Uh, so um, sometimes... Good, good tweet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possible. Because uh, there, you know, there are some organizations that say, I, I won't take money from the tobacco industry for this and that. Uh, but uh, if you have um, your pillars and, uh, you know, a donor it can give you money to something that you really believe it's going to have impact and uh, it's according to what you believe. I don't see a problem in there. So, uh, but yes, go for it and uh, do networking and just jump in. I, I think the message is, is that. Okay, final comments, Guy, Mage, yeah, and then I'll wrap I up. just qualify what Christine <laughs> said. I qualify what she would say. I think you can dance with some devils, <laughs> but not all devils. <laughs> and I don't think you can tango with any devil. <laughs> um, I have a somewhat different perspective about this approach, clearly influenced because I work only in the niche of independent di native digital media and that allows us to have a purpose that is often very clear and not so wide. 
and a commitment with causes that are very specific. And if I could give advice to a new graduate who is creating a media or a program that is being developed for media support, I would say that the most important thing is that what is bulletproof in any sustainability strategy is to define your mission and set the impact metrics for that media. With that, you have a guideline of what are the organizations that might with which you may work, providing a service or partner with, but you will also find those organizations in the world that share those values or have the same objective. We have to remember that we are trying to provide a public service, and that is very important because in the donor world, it is very easy to get lost with the different agendas that donors have, and that is counterproductive for an organization that's trying to defend democracy. So if we, I could reinforce one point, it would be to review and be committed to the organizational purpose, even if it varies through time or develops through time. Terrific uh, audience today. Um, look, I've really enjoyed this panel, and to be honest, I'm really enjoying this principles project. I feel like we're surfacing some um, some really important issues that we have. Fr frankly, we take a little too much for granted, and it, and many of them are within our power to influence. Actually, especially if we're acting collectively, um, and we have an opportunity with some allies on the donors. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if I can continue to elaborate the metaphor, but you know, there, there, uh, we, they, there are some really good people within the donors who share our concerns, and they actually need our help to take these messages uh, to the folks uh, higher up in those organizations. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of goodwill to get this work done. Um, the next steps are that SEMA and GFMD, um, with partners like UNESCO, uh, we'll continue to hold some consultations. We hope to have a draft of these principles. Um, perhaps by late summer, we'll share those and solicit your feedback. They're going to be very brief. These principles are like four pages, so uh, are, are shorter. We also, though, understand that that the work doesn't end there, and we hope that this will be the start of a conversation for you know plans of action, some real implementation, and that will be the work to come uh, beyond the development of the principles. And of course, we'll hand these over to the OECD DAC, and that will kickstart another formal consultative process. We'll have no, we won't have control over what comes out of that, uh, but certainly we can continue to influence that process as well. So uh, we uh, look forward to keeping you guys engaged on this, and um, uh, just thanks very much for the opportunity to present this here at World Press Freedom Day. Thanks very much, everybody. Yes,